All right, here we are, Genesis, uh, the foundation book of the Bible. This is lesson number 12. If you're reading out of your Bibles, um, just open them up to Genesis chapter two. So, so far in our uh, series, we've covered uh, Genesis chapter one, verse one, to Genesis chapter two, verse seven, for those people saying that we're slow, 13 weeks is not so bad to cover a chapter. It's good, it's good. We will be picking up the pace. In this section, uh, the Bible, I'll do a little review here very quickly. What we've looked at so far, the creation of the inanimate world, in other words, non-living things. The creation of the animate world, those things that live and breathe. The creation of man, who is a combination of inanimate things, the material of his body, for example. He is also animate, in other words, he lives and he breathes like animals do. And also the spiritual. Man is aware of not only himself and others, but he is also aware of God, and that's the spiritual element in him that he has. He has a triune nature. We talked about his triune nature in the same way that God has a triune in nature, and in that way he is made in the image of God. And then of course Moses, uh, who is the author, we believe is the author of this, uh, of this book. Uh, he also gives some detailed description of the way God created man and a glimpse into the condition of the environment in the world where sin did not yet exist. So that's what we've covered so far. In the next section he's going to begin describing the location where Adam lived the establishment of the principle of law and man's first interaction with his environment. Interesting stuff. So let's go to Genesis chapter two. Let's look at verse eight. And it says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Very interesting. In a, in a way, he simply summarizes what God did with man once man was created. He put him in a special place, a place that would be his home. The term Eden, by the way, comes from a word which means delight, delight. Verse nine, keep going. It says, out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in this place, God Himself prepared a garden that would serve as Adam's home, uh, a place where he would have the resources he needs to live. I want you to note that when God made the plants, they simply appeared. But this garden, God Himself formed it with the specific purpose of placing Adam and providing for his personal needs. So the, the place of Eden was something special that God made. It wasn't just, uh, you know, there's grass, there's trees everywhere, oh, let's put them over here to the left. You know. No, this was a special place where God placed Adam. Two trees are noted, one, the tree of life, two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, you know, it could be symbolic of spiritual truth or God's word as well as, well, an actual tree, perhaps with health or life-sustaining properties. Remember, initially man is created to live forever. And there's no plan for death there. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we know was an actual tree of some kind because Adam and Eve, or rather Eve first, and then Adam actually ate the fruit of it. The Bible doesn't really say what kind of fruit. The apple idea comes from another source. There were no apples then. Apples are kind of a hybrid fruit, a fruit of some kind. Let's keep reading, shall we? In verse 10 it says, Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good the delium and the onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon and it flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, it flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. 
And so the author described, well God is the author, but the one who's you know, you know, putting the book together describes rivers that are contained in this area. Remember that this was geography before the flood. Before the flood, because the flood wiped away all of these ancient pre-flood uh, pre, pre landmarks. There was one river that went through the garden that apparently separated into four. Heidekel is later associated with Assyrian monuments and referred to as the Tigris. And then you have Euphrates, Pishon, and Gihon rivers uh, that are mentioned, areas that are mentioned. You need to remember that the geography described and the way that the rivers flow do not match any known geography of our day. And so it seems that Genesis is describing the pre-flood geography that was ultimately destroyed, as Peter says, the world that then was, let me just get it here, it says, um, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse six. So the pre-flood names were kept to describe post-flood lands and rivers. They weren't necessarily in the same place. They simply take, took the names and attached them to post-flood places. There's also a mention of precious stones, many of which we don't have an idea as to their nature. Suffice to say that God prepared an earthly home for Adam, which he describes, and which gives us another glimpse into a world that no longer, that no longer exists. So that's a little geography. You know, we can debate this all day long. I think the thing that we need to remember that's most important here for us as far as geography is concerned is that the points of geography mentioned here no longer exist. They were wiped away by the flood. But because of the record, names that were there were just taken and, and given to various rivers and places that exist today. However, we know that that general area where it is because the most ancient finds are in that are in that area of early civilization. All right, so now we're going to talk about the moral choice. This is, to me, this is the most fascinating part of this section. So what do we have so far? Man is fully equipped. He has a body, he exists. He has a soul that animates his body and enables him to coexist and relate to his environment. Let's read verse 15. It says, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Um, he has a spirit also that enables him to coexist and relate to God. So he has a soul that makes him exist in the physical world with an other animate creatures. He has a spirit that enables him to communicate with and to relate to God who is a spirit. But now God needs to create the environment which, within which man will coexist with him. So let me digress a little bit and explain this idea. As a physical being, man dwells in the environment of the earth. You know, land, water, air, animals, so on and so forth, vegetation. And man depends on these things to stay alive, to eat, to breathe the air, to drink the water. You know, he interacts with the physical environment and God has equipped him to be able to do that. He has a body which is able to exist in the physical environment. He has a soul which enables him to be animate. In other words, he can walk and think and you know, he sees other living things and so on and so forth. But God, is a spirit. He's not physical. He's not part of the environment. He's separate from his creation. How does man connect with God? Where does man relate to and connect with, you know, with the spirit? If he wants to connect with an animal, he can touch an animal, he can feed an animal, he can harness an animal's power for his own use. He can eat the vegetation and the fruit. He can walk on the land, breathe the air, swim in the water, drink in it. You know, he's able to connect with his physical environment, but how does he connect with God? 
Okay, that's the, that's the problem. The answer to this question is man connects with God in the moral realm. In the moral realm. God is holy and pure and just and loving. And so therefore man will meet with and relate to God in these terms and within these realities. Okay, so a tree you can touch and dirt you can touch and an animal you can hear and watch and so on and so forth, but God, how do you perceive God? He is holy, you know, how do you describe God? Well, He's holy, He's just, He's righteous, He's this, He's that. Uh, how do you touch holy? How do you perceive righteousness? You know, how, where, how do you do that? How do you experience that? And so in order to bring these kind of abstract spiritual things into view, into man's world, God creates a moral framework or a world into which he and man can now meet and relate. So just as man meets and relates to the physical environment which God created, the physical world, now man is going to interact with God, not in the physical environment, he's going, to, he's going to meet and interact with God in the moral environment. That's how he's going to relate to God. So let's read 16, 17. I'm going to give you more stuff about this. It says, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So the command is lived out in the physical world, whether you, you eat or you don't eat, because that's a physical thing. But the response to the command is what brings God into view for man. You see, God lives in the world of absolute holiness and justice and love and peace. How does this man, Adam, enter into this world? Well, he enters into it through the exercise of his will in responding to God's command. That's how he deals with God. That's how he relates to God. So, let me explain how that works. To obey the command is to express trust and love and respect, and to obey the command leads to the experience of love and blessings, joy and peace, all of these things have no earthly equivalent. There's no peace. Is there the peace plant? Is there the love bush? Is there the righteousness animal? Those things don't exist in the physical world. They exist in the metaphysical world, in the spiritual world. But do they affect the man in the physical world? Yes. In obeying the command, man actually experiences in his body peace, love, righteousness. Holiness. He gets to experience God by obeying God or, or disobeying Him. And so to obey expresses his trust and love and respect for God, all the things that have no earthly equivalent. These are the realities of the spiritual world where God lives, made known to man through the moral command to obey. Now, conversely, to disobey signifies rebellion, ingratitude, hatred, and the knowledge of death, heretofore hidden from sight. So evil exists and it can be experienced or it can be known through disobedience. So just as peace and joy and love and so on and so forth can be experienced, so can guilt and shame and fear and dread and judgment can also be experienced. And the thing that sparks that physical experience is when we come into contact with God in the moral, in the moral realm, okay? So by giving the command, therefore, thou shalt not you know, eat the, tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, by giving this command, God does several things. First, He activates man's ability to use his intelligence in a moral context. So far, man is using his intelligence in a physical context. You know, I 
this is what I have to do to eat, and if I must walk over here to, to, to get these veg, vegetables, I need to harvest, and I need to, you know, I need to learn how to control these animals so they'll work for me, or I can ride them. You know, he's using his intelligence in dealing with the physical uh, universe. By giving the command, God activates man's ability to use his intelligence, not in the physical world, but in the moral world. Not just to provide food and so on and so forth, but to deal with God. All right? Secondly, by giving the command, God puts man's destiny into man's own hands. Man never had unlimited freedom because ultimately God is there and we cannot destroy or rule over God. There, listen, there is no such thing as absolute freedom. That doesn't exist. In the United States we like to say this is the land of the free and the brave, you know, or the brave and the free. And I, you often hear politicians saying, you know, freedom, that's what it's all about, and America is all about freedom. And yes, we do have a higher degree of freedom here than, say, in communist China. Yes. But there is no such thing as absolute freedom. If we were absolutely free, we would be God. Only God is absolutely free. We can have a high degree of social freedom, but in the end, we are still under the authority of God. He still has the authority to tell us what to do, to tell us what is right and what is wrong, and so on and so forth. So we're not, we're not free. We're, we're free to move to Chicago or live in Texas, and we're free to become pipe fitters or surgeons or waiters or writers or singers. You know, we're free to do all that kind of stuff, and we're free you know, to marry uh, Josephine or to marry uh, you know, uh, Susan. We're free to do those things. But we're not free to disobey God. <laughs> we don't have that freedom. He hasn't given us that freedom. And so, by, by putting the command into motion, man is given the freedom to choose either the very best life for himself with God or destroy his life by rejecting God. God gives man the power over his own life. Now you say, well, we know all that. Doesn't everybody know that? The Eastern religions don't know that. The Eastern religions, they believe everything is fate. Everything's locked in. Doesn't matter what you do, it's fate. We don't believe that. That's not what the Bible teaches. And then the third thing, by giving the command, God makes possible a way for man to perceive Him. How can I see God? He's a spirit. How can I perceive Him? Man cannot perceive God merely through physical means, so God provides a moral environment where man can experience his relationship with God for good or for bad. Okay, you know what the command is, uh, thou shalt not steal. And let's just say there's a great opportunity for you to steal something. Maybe you're under pressure, you need the money, nobody would ever know, just you, you know, and you resist the temptation to steal. What is it that you feel after? Well, you usually feel pretty good after that. You know, say, well, I could have used the money, but you know, I want to sleep at night. Well, that, that feeling of justification and righteousness because you resisted the temptation, that's an experience of God. It's not the only experience of God. Through Jesus Christ, who will be revealed later on in history, we will get a much clearer view and a so much better experience of God. But at this stage, at this stage, we're experiencing God by obeying you know, or disobeying His moral command. I can feel good and righteous and at peace and justified because I've done what, you know, what He has said. Or I can feel guilty and shameful and fearful and dreadful because I've disobeyed. That's an experience of God. So in this passage, God not only does it for Adam, 
but by establishing the principle of law, he does so for every other human being that will ever live. Like I said, got to kind of move here a little tight on time. Let's talk about man and the animals very quickly. Now that man is a complete physical, spiritual, and moral being, God is going to provide a partner to complete that creation. But first, God is going to educate Adam about the creation and the creatures that inhabit it with him. Now one thing the Bible does not do is establish any common ancestry between man and animals. The evolutionary idea that man is a descendant of animals, most likely apes, is refuted by the Bible and by many scientists as well. You know, if you watch TV, you'd think every single scientist in the world believes in evolution, but that's not true. The missing links you know, that would demonstrate a progression from apes to man are still missing today, like they were in the day of Darwin who first proposed the idea. It's still speculation. Anthropologists and paleontologists have found fossils of both apes and man, but yet have to discover, or, or as of yet, have not discovered anything that links the two. Every couple of years there's always a new one that comes out, but it's always eventually debunked. In recent years, I mean, in you know, the last decades, some scientists have put forth the so-called uh, Australopithecus fossils as a possible missing link. But then more recent discoveries come along and show that the missing link was probably just an ape with a smaller head, smaller skull and smaller teeth. And the reason for that was its diet. It wasn't eating the same thing as the bigger apes. A couple of doctors, Leakey and Johansson, both anthropologists, tell us that the fossils that were truly human and the fossils that were truly ape-like were found as early as the time of uh, Australopithecus or Homo erectus. You know, those are you know, timelines in the past. So, so far as the research shows, man has always been man and apes have always been apes, exactly as the Bible says. You know, the Bible doesn't show a common core. Men were created separately uh, than the animals. So let's read verse 18 here, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So God has already said that all he sees is very good. So his pronouncement regarding Adam is not about evil, but about completeness. Adam is OK, but his status, in other words, he's alone. That's not a good thing, God says. So how do you convey this to Adam? He's alone, and this is not according to God's complete design, but how do you make him aware of it? I mean, he doesn't know what he's missing. You know, he doesn't know what he doesn't know. So the Bible says that man should not be alone. This is not his natural state, and so what God will do is he'll make a help that is meet for him. I want you to notice that it is God who is the one who declares that being alone is not good not man. It isn't Adam who said, you know, I, I, it's not a good thing I'm alone. I, he didn't say that. God is the one. He looks down and says, it's not good for man to be alone. And God specifically determines the type of companion that man will have. I want to talk about that word helpmeet. The term is a help meet for him, not a helpmeet, one word. The original root of this word meant to surround or to protect. In its form in Genesis, it means to aid or to help. The word meet is exactly the same Hebrew word, but in a different form. So together, you could say a helper to help him or an aid to assist, and here's the key word, to assist or to save him. Someone say, well, save him from what? will save him from his loneliness and his incompleteness. I'm almost done, just one more scripture here. But before God provides this, he brings Adam to the realization of his need through his interaction with the animal world. Very fascinating. So let's read 19 and 20, those are the last verses. It says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. 
The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So, God brings to Adam a review of the animals that he has created, and Adam names them. Now this suggests several, several things about Adam and this exercise. First of all, Adam was created with some form of language that we're not aware of at this time, but could be used for communication and understanding at that time. So we know that language was also created by God and developed into many varieties over time. Secondly, we see that Adam uh, is an intelligent being. Um, that he gave names suggests that he was an intelligent being who understood the nature and the role of animals in creation and he named them based on this um, intuitive intelligence. Just to name them is not just, oh, I'm going to call you a zebra and I'm going to call you a ah, monkey, that's fun, monkeys are fun, right? And I'm going to call you a horse, no, no. The name here means he gives them a term that demonstrates his understanding of what this animal is and how this animal fits into all of the creation. Thirdly, we see that Adam, um, uh, we, we see that the animal world taught Adam three very important things. Sorry about the small, uh, uh, the small um, uh, print there. Let me just tell them to you. Three very important things, and then we're done for, uh, for this lesson. Number one, it shows him that he was superior to the creation in which he lived. In other words, the animals didn't talk back. You know, he said, you know, that's a zebra, and the zebra didn't say, oh, and you're Adam. <laughs> so this naming of the animals in creation demonstrates that you know, Adam was superior to his creation, or to God's creation. Also, it teaches him that he's alone. I mean, you know, all the animals are in pairs, but he's alone. They're living, you know, sentient beings. They're two by two. He's just all by himself. You know, eventually he gets the idea, wait a minute, something, something's wrong here. And thirdly, he learns that he could rule over the animal world as God had told him to do, but he could not have fellowship with them. For this, he realized he would need a special kind of companion. You know, we have a you, know, you have a pet, a dog, a cat, it's very nice, you know, but you can't have fellowship with your dog. You can go out hunting with your dog, that's great. You know, hey boy, you know, go get the, you know, the dead bird. But you can't, how are you feeling today? You know, let me tell you about my day. You, know, no, you don't have that kind of thing. So this prepares Adam for God's final act of creation. We're going to pick that up next time. Uh, the forming of God's crown of creation, which is which is woman. And that's, we're going to stop right there because we've got a lot to say about the creation of a woman. And that's it. Thank you very much.